but since this is like the beginning of what is the official talk, it's okay. So, um, yes. So this is sit on sets for linear forms. That's, uh, that's what this is about. So a sit on set in the integers or an abelian group is a set A with the property that um, if A1, A2, A3, A4 are in the set and A1 plus A2 equals A3 plus A4, then the numbers on the left are the same as the numbers on the right. So the, okay, they could be written, I mean, two plus three and three plus two is the same thing. So these two numbers, it's the same set as the two numbers on the other side. And there's no reason just to look at twofold sums. You can have sort of H sit on sets or BH sets. And you have the same condition that if you have A1 plus A2 up to A sub H equal AH plus one plus AH plus two up to A sub two H, then, and all these belong to this set A, then the set of numbers on the left, actually I should say this a little bit more carefully, but um, this is not quite right. Um, I'll just put a little swiggy there. Is essentially the numbers on the left. Numbers on the left are the numbers on the right. Also counting multiplicities. So if a number occurs here three times, the same number occurs here three times and so forth. So there is of course an infinite literature on sit on sets and still an enormous number of open problems. Uh, and some of the most easily stated problems are still completely mysterious. But uh, what I had started to look at was something slightly different. So in the case of these classical sit on sets, you're basically looking at a sort of this linear form x1 up to x sub h, you have a set A of whatever it is, um, integers or whatever, doesn't matter. Um, um, and we look at this, the image of the set A under phi, that is everything you can write is summation A sub i, i goes from one up to h. And we want to know if numbers that appear in this image have a unique representation. That's the whole idea. So the uh, natural sort of, a natural uh, variant of this is to look at the following situation. So suppose we let, um, let's say, let me just put it in a sort of a slightly general context. So let F be a field, V a vector space, over F and we have a linear form phi of X1 up to X sub H, which is C1 X1 plus C2 X2 up to C sub H X sub H. And I want to say that a, um, and where the C sub I's are elements in the field. So, this is defined where the X's are elements of the field or vectors over the field, it's just scalar multiplication. So, um, so we can say that uh, a set A contained in V is a phi sit on set, that is a sit on set with respect to this linear form if um, uh, for all H tuples A1 up to A sub H in A to the H and 
Let me rest away. A1 prime, A2 prime, up to A sub H prime in A to the H. If phi of A1 up to AH equals phi of A1 prime up to A sub H, then these n tuples or H tuples are the same. Sorry, so H is fixed, right? Yeah, H, well, the linear form is fixed. So H is fixed and these and the coefficients are fixed. Thank you. So in the classical case, we just take all the C's to be equal to one. Okay. But there's a little subtlety here. Um, if you let all the C's be equal to one, there is no sit on set um, because I'm actually imposing a stronger requirement here. I'm not saying that the set of the A's is the set of the A primes. I'm saying that this H tuple is exactly the same as this H tuple. So the order matters. And, you know, in the case of, let's say, sit on sets, um, you have phi of x1, x2 equal x1 plus x2. So you have phi of 2, 3 is 2 plus 3, which is 3 plus 2, which is phi of 3, 2. So th there is no sit on set because this p ordered pair is different from this ordered pair. So there is a significant difference between the classical definition of a sit on set where the order doesn't matter because you're just taking a sum and this definition for linear forms. Okay. So in fact, for the linear form, phi equal to just the sum of these h variables, there exists no sit on set A that has at least two elements, right? So- It's enough that, to, it's enough that two of the Cs be equal. Excuse me? It's enough that two of the Cs be equal to mess That's things up. That is true. That is sufficient. Or you could have one of the C's be equal to zero. That would also mess things up. Right. So we can state the following. Um, I feel like um, you're the guy I planted in the audience to ask the question or to <laughs> make the uh, comment. Um, suppose we have, so thank you. Uh, so suppose we have this linear form C1, X1 up to C sub H, X sub H. So coefficients in this field F. And um, for any subset I of one up to H, um, let S sub I be the sum of the coefficients C sub I for I in I. And so if, there exist disjoint subsets I1 and I2 of one up to H such that SI1 equals SI2. So the sum of the coefficients in the I1 set equals the sum of the coefficients of the I2 set, um, then no sit on set uh, A with at least two elements exists. And now you can sort of write down the reason in uh, a line as follows. So, So suppose you have elements U, V, W in a set A, uh, U different from V, W can be, can be U or V or anything else. And if you let uh, AI be equal to uh, U, if I is in the set I1 and V if I is in the set I2 and W if I is in, um, so you let, uh, I3 be just everything else, everything from one up to H 
which is not an I1 or I2. So, so we've partitioned the integers from one to H up into these three sets, the pairwise disjoint sets. We let AI be U if I is an I1, V if I is an I2, and W if it's an I3, and AI prime to be equal to V for I and I1, U for I in I2, and W for I in I3. Um, I1 and I2 are not both empty. Um, so, if you take phi of A1 up to A sub H, that's summation C sub I, A sub I um, from one up to H, but you can write this as I and I1, I and I2, I and I3. But for I and I1, this is U, this is V, and this is W. So you can factor out the U and the V and the W. And, but we're assuming that this sum over I, the I1 coefficients is the sum over the I2 coefficients. So this is the same as the sum over I2, C sub I times U plus the sum over I and I1, C sub I times V plus the sum for I and I3, C sub I times W. And this is exactly phi of A1 prime up to A sub H prime. And this H tuple is different from this H tuple. So if you have, uh, so this condition destroys any possibility of having a um, sit on set. And, um, and in fact, so, uh, let's see. I had a name for this um, based on the word no. Um, so, so let's say that the linear form phi equals summation ci xi uh, has property n if si1 is different from si2 these are the sums of coefficients for all I1, I2 subsets of one up to H with I1 intersect I2 empty and not both empty. I1 union I2 equals the empty set. So if phi, um, fails this property, then there is no sit on set. And there's a theorem that says, in fact, that's necessary and sufficient. So yeah, you did mean to write the union's not empty, right? Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, sure. thank you. So um, there exists a fee sit on set for, um, there exists a seat on set. Uh, a with cardinality of A, actually, let me just say it differently, theorem. So we have a linear form, phi equal summation ci xi, and the following are equivalent. The first is there exists an infinite sit on set, an infinite phi sit on set. Um, so you have some infinite vector space, and in that vector space, you can find an infinite sit on set for this linear form. Um, there exists a phi sit on set A that has at least two elements and the linear form phi has this property N, which means pairwise distinct coefficient subset sums. So it's clear, of course, 
if you have an infinite set, you certainly have an infinite sit on set. You certainly have an infinite sit on set that has at least two elements. And I just proved that if you have an infinite sit on set that has at least two elements, then the linear form has this property n. And what takes a little bit of work is to prove that this is sufficient. Uh, if you have an in, if you have a, a linear form with this property n, then there exists an infinite uh, sit on set. And um, yeah. Um, That, um, that takes a tiny bit of work perhaps, but um, uh, so I'm not gonna give the proof because I just wanna mention a number of results. And um, the, um, um, there will be a, um, oops, let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, Kevin, are you checking people who are trying to log on and letting them in? Uh, yes, I am. Good, thank you. Okay, so I don't have to worry about that. I just thought I missed someone, so. I, there's been a steady stream of admissions. Okay, um, so if this property is satisfied, so this property is the necessary and sufficient condition for a linear form to have a sit-on set. Now, There are lots of questions about sit-on sets and uh, or strange ways of looking at these. Um, remember, I have a field F and um, I wanna suppose I have a field F with an absolute value. Um, so that means that um, the absolute value of C is greater than or equal to zero for every element in the field. The absolute value of C is zero if and only if C is zero. Um, it's multiplicative. The absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. And um, you have a triangle inequality. And the absolute value is trivial if the absolute value of C is equal to one for all C different from zero. And I'm only interested in non-trivial absolute values. And for a non-trivial absolute value, um, if you take the imp of the absolute values of all the elements different from zero, that's equal to zero. That is, there are arbitrarily, there are non-zero elements, well, obviously non-zero, with, ob with arbitrarily small absolute values. And we say that a vector space over F has a norm with respect to the absolute value if we have this function um, on vectors with the sort of natural properties, then the norm of every vector is non-negative and equals zero if and only if the vector is zero. Uh, a scalar multiple of V has a norm, which is the absolute value of C times the norm of V. And the norm of V plus W is less than the norm of V plus the norm of W. So um, all the absolute values we know and love, the usual absolute value, the p-adic absolute values are non-trivial and there are lots of norm spaces, norm vector spaces. And what I'm interested in is um, If you take an arbit, so so let phi be a um, linear form over this field F that has property n. 
That means um, sit on sets still exist. And that B sub K be any infinite sequence of vectors in the vector space. Let epsilon sub K be any sequence of positive numbers. They can be as small as you want to make them. So, so we say that the a sequence A sub K of vectors in this norm vector space is an epsilon perturbation of a sequence B sub K if the norm of the vector AK minus BK is less than epsilon K for all K. So, so we have the following theorem. So we have this linear form with this property n, so sit on sets exist. And we have a norm vector space over the field. Um, for every sequence V sub K in V and every um, sequence of little positive numbers there exists a phi sit on set um, a sub K that is an epsilon perturbation of the sequence of B sub Ks. Um, so, yeah. Um, so this says, and I guess in a certain sense that there are a lot of sit on sets, but it, you know, it says more than that. And um, I mean, it says exactly what it says that if you give me any sequence, no matter how bizarre, I can find some tiny, 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 tiny infinitesimal perturbation that's a phi sit on set. And um, yeah. And there is a, um, So, uh, which fields admit this kind of an absolute value, right? Finite fields certainly don't. Correct. Um, but every field you know and love does. Right. That's all. I mean, in real life, is there anything other than the reals, the complexes, the p-adics, some function fields, whatever? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are lots of fields with absolute values. But you know, if you just want to think of the real numbers or the complex numbers or the rationals, that's good. Um, it's just that, I mean, and, 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 and I mean, for me, the main interest is really always the integers and the rational numbers. It's just a fact that uh, when you prove the theorem uh, there, you're using very little. Uh, you're re really just using the fact, well, you're just using that you have an absolute value. Um, so the only paper I know on sit on sets in, in the real numbers 
is an old paper by uh, Filari Javier Filarillo. I never pronounced his name right, and he died <laughs> a few years ago, so I can't ask him anymore. Um, and uh, and Ruja, and um, but they're just looking at the real numbers, and they make some sort of generic statement in passing that um, there are a lot of sit-on sets in the reels uh, without saying what they mean by that. And that's not the purpose of their paper. They're looking at sit on sets in the reels for different reasons. Um, but this is, if you like, a very precise uh, statement of the fact that in the reels or in any field where you have an absolute value, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, infinite sit on sets. And, and it doesn't even depend on working in the field. You can just take a vector space over the field and be working in the vector space. Uh, the proofs only use the fact that you have this absolute value in the norm. That's all. Um, now, in the special case where you take the field to be the rational numbers, um, you can say the following. Let me find my theorem or a theorem. Um, so suppose we take phi, my linear form with rational coefficients. Um, that P sub K be a sequence of prime numbers. Um, that epsilon k be some sequence of real numbers that are positive. Um, so for every um, sequence b of integers, every sequence B of integers, there is there exists a strictly increasing sequence of positive integers where AK minus BK, the p-adic value um, is less than epsilon. Um, and not just for one p-adic value, but so AK minus PK, the, the p-adic the, the p-adic value for PJ for all J less than or equal to K simultaneously is less than epsilon. I mean, uh, um, no, yeah. The point is that you have like this p-adic version that you can prove very nicely here, where you can p-adically approximate any sequence of integers with a strictly increasing sequence of integers, which are first of all positive. And second, this, new, this sequence you've constructed p-adically approximates your original, your original sequence, if you like, for every prime from some point on. So it's simultaneously approximating the sequence periodically for all p. Um, uh, and I presume it's the point is that it's it's a phi c done set, right? Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, thank you. That's sort of the point. Uh, yes, phi c done. <laughs> the purpose of life for <laughs> this hour is to show the existence of interesting phi c done sets. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, hey, Mel, is there some uh, adelic formulation of what you're saying? Uh, I mean, I... Right, it, so um, I, I haven't written everything up yet. I mean, what I've, everything I've said, I, I've written down and um, I will post on archive in a couple of days. There's an old version of this, but, and I was thinking, should I just express this adelically? But it's just, and I don't know if there, I mean, you can, because I'm, you know, basically I'm looking at like a product over all the p-adic valuations, but I don't know if I gain anything from that. Right? 
probably a cleaner statement, uh, but yeah. I mean, um, you know, as in many things, it's always the question of the language you speak, and um, you know, so yeah, um, but it certainly is an adelic statement, uh, yeah. yeah, whether or not you actually write it down that way. Um, okay. Um, Another direction in which you can look at these phi sit on sets. Again, um, thinking about the classical problems, um, a, a, one of the original questions about classical sit on sets is um, how big can they be or how dense can they be? And there's an extraordinarily interesting phenomenon about classical sit on sets. Um, so classical sit on sets, B2 sets, um, we can ask for the uh, maximum size of a set A, which is contained in the integers from one up to N and is sit on. Okay. So, um, and the answer is that this is approximately um, square root of n. You know, so let's say bounded above and below by constant times root n, but the order of this is square root of n. And it can't be any bigger, but in fact, you can do constructions which get you something like this. This is for finite. What about infinite? So for infinite sets, you have an infinite sit on set A contained in the positive integers. So it's an infinite set. And so how many are there? They're infinitely many. But what you tend to ask is, uh, suppose we let A of T count the number of elements of the set A between one and T. So of course, if you have an infinite sit on set, a finite subset will be a sit on set. So we know that this can't be any bigger than the square root of N, so square root of T. Let me write this as just to keep the notation the same. Well, square root of, well, square root of N. And you might try to construct an infinite sit on set where um, A of N is let's say greater than C times the square root of N for some C greater than zero and all N. And I mean, you can construct finite sit on sets between one and n, which have order square root of n elements, but what about infinite sit on sets? And there's a beautiful theorem of Erdős, which he never published, but uh, he wrote a letter to Alfred Stör with the, the statement and proof of the theorem, and Stör included it in a famous survey he wrote on uh, problems and solved and unsolved problems in additive number theory a long time ago. And he cites, and he, and he says, this is a theorem of Erdős. And Erdős's theorem says that for infinite sit on sets, um, there exists some C greater than zero such that, um, so here, this would say a of n over the square root of n is bounded away from zero is greater than c, where a of n over the square root of n is always less than or equal to c over the square root of log n. So this is going to zero. So this can't be bounded away from zero. So there is that's a, a, Yeah, that's for infinitely many n, not all n though. Okay. Um, So this is a striking contrast with the finite case. 
And this is really a very interesting phenomenon. I mean, in combinatorics, uh, you know, people like to count things and you have things that can be defined for finite sets and things that can be defined for infinite sets, or you have a property that might be help, might apply to a finite set and might apply to an infinite set. But, uh, and this is, as far as I know, the first instance where the uh, growth rate of the finite set uh, is completely different from the growth rate of the infinite set. In fact, very recently, in the last week or two, I think I saw a paper on archive by Jacob Fox and uh, two or three or four co-authors exploring exactly this phenomenon in other combinatorial situations. And I think they start by pointing out this theorem of Erdős as like the archetype of this um, phenomenon. So, but in any case, the point is that in the study of Sidon sets, um, counting the size of them in the finite or the infinite case is, um, is a, like a basic problem. And we could ask the same thing for our phi Sidon sets. So suppose we have, let's just say a field F with an absolute value And instead of looking at vectors over F, let's just look at subsets of F. So X is a subset of F and we have this counting function, X of T, which will be the number of elements in X with the absolute value of X at most T. It could be infinite, could be finite. And one can, um, uh, sort of copy the um, um, the sort of standard counting argument, the combinatorial counting argument for Sidon sets, and uh, um, get the following kind of result. Um, so we have this linear form uh, for which uh, Sidon sets exist. Um, Suppose we let capital C be the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients. And let X be a subset of the field that where phi maps X into itself. So phi of X is contained in X. If A is a phi sit on subset in X, then the counting function for A, A of T, the number of elements of A with absolute value of most T is bounded above by the counting function of X, C of T to the power one over H. So I should just say, if this were a binary form with H equal to two, this would be the square root of X over C of T. So this would be exactly, um, this is, so this is basically square root of whatever for H equal two. And uh, there's an analogous uh, upper bound for the size of a BH set or an H fold sit on set, which is the one over H power more or less. And it's exactly the same argument, which gives us the one over H power here. So this is like the, simplest upper bound for this function a of t. And um, what I don't know, you might say, I think of this as an open question, is, um, is there um, the analog of the Erdős theorem here? The theorem that says, in fact, uh, you can't have a set which is in fact this big, um, that this divided by this must go to zero. Um, let me just mention, um, uh, well, there are a lot of problems, but let me just mention one other thing which one can do. Um, so this is last remark or problem or whatever. 
um, last. So we've been looking at a linear form C, C1, X1, up to Cn, Xn. So we have a field F, the C sub i's are in F. This is a linear form and it can operate on a vector space over F. Um, and these are vectors or <sighs> so Let's just take V to be the vector space to be Fn, just the n-tuples. So phi of a vector x so phi maps, I'm sorry, uh, Fn into F, right? That's our linear form. And uh, if you're going to think about linear forms, um, you could think of taking more than one, which is essentially the same thing as taking either M linear forms um, or an M by N matrix C. So this maps Fn into Fm and a um, um, sit on set with respect to the matrix with respect to C is simply a um, set A of vectors in Fn such that C restricted to A is one to one. I mean, when we talk about sit on sets, we just mean we have this some function, some linear form, and a, a sit on set is just a set which restricted to uh, where the form restricted to that set is one to one. So you can just as well look at sets of vectors, uh, look at matrices and sets of vectors. And uh, in some sense, the, the most interesting case uh, for me is when you have C is an M by N matrix with integer coefficients. And um, instead of looking at all vectors, let's just look at C as a map from n-dimensional lattice points to m-dimensional lattice points. And we want to find, uh, we want to say something non-trivial about um, sit-on sets with respect to this. And in this case, it's really very pretty. There are some things you can say, which I won't have time to say uh, right now, but um, there's something called Ziegel's Lemma, which has many um, high powered variations. But if you go back and you read uh, Ziegel's paper in which he proves Ziegel's Lemma He's really just talking about integer matrices from Zn to Cm, Zm. And um, he's giving you some bounds on the possible size of sit-on sets. So um, anyway, this is uh, stuff that I'm in the process of trying to write down. But it is very interesting that Ziegel's lemma, which is really something that is used uh, infinitely often in Diophantine approximations and such things uh, applies directly to this case of sit on sets. Anyway, I thank you all. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you could tear yourself away from the impeachment trial for an hour. And um, but next Thursday, the trial will be over. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all. OK. Thank you, Mel. Thank you. Done. Okay. Um, happy to answer questions or listen to anyone's remarks. Um, let's see. Tori, um, we're supposed to chat for a few minutes at the end if you have some time. So 
after everyone has disappeared, we'll talk. <laughs> I'll take okay. care then. Okay. Bye, all. See you next week. Bye. See you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Oh, okay. So where are you physically um, I, right now? I'm in Wisconsin. Um, okay. Yeah, I go to a small liberal arts school called Ripping College. Yep, I know it. Yeah. Uh, I, for some reason, I associate that with politics. Um. Yeah, so Ripping, Wisconsin is the home uh, like where the original Republican Party was founded. Um, and the president of our college is a politics professor as well. So one of the reasons I would assume. Right. I don't know. Uh, but you're a math major, obviously. And yes. you're applying to graduate school. And the my colleagues said they would love for you to come, I guess. But uh, uh, but then yeah. they also said you were, you, you were coming to the seminar. So we should try to chat. Yeah, um, yeah, I've applied to a whole bunch of schools. Um, was accepted to CUNY like last week, I think. So doing all sorts of fun virtual visit options now. Is your school open physically? Yes, um, I'm on campus right now. And are your classes actually being held in classrooms? I personally aren't. A lot of they're kind of half and half. Some professors have chosen to do online, some do in person. Last semester, my professors, the professors I had then, chose to do in like on in person classes. There we go. But all the ones I had this semester are online. Right. And what are you interested in in mathematics? Um, I'm not entirely decided yet. I'm primarily leaning towards like geometry or topology or algebra, but number theory is also a field that's interested me. I just haven't had as much exposure to it. So, this so have you gone to any of, or tried to uh, zoom into any of the geometry topology seminars at the grad center? Because no, there are a lot. I, yeah, I am supposed to be attending one either next week or the week after, I think. I don't know the exact date right now. Um, I mean, you should probably try to get into, log into one of Dennis Sullivan's seminars, even though it's probably incomprehensible. But he's sort of like a cool guy, so it's. I'll make do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Anything I can tell you? Um, <laughs> Have you been to New York much? I have visited New York State once eight years ago um, at New York City, so. Right. Have yeah. you lived in a city or are you from a small town or? No, I'm different? from a small town of about um, a little under 2,500 people, so. In Wisconsin or somewhere else? Yeah, yeah, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it would be a big change, but. Yeah, well, I mean, it's cool. Yeah. I can live with it. We'll see if my parents can. Oh, well, yeah. Um, not my problem. 
Yeah, the only problem is this COVID business because no one knows when we're going to open up again. Um, so I know that in the fall semester, at least at the undergraduate colleges, uh, it's going to be partly online and partly hybrid. And um, I mean, it's just strange. Like, there's a, a friend of mine who was actually at the seminar has a daughter who's a freshman in college this year. And the first semester, she was just at home. I mean, there was, yeah. they closed the campus. And this semester, they opened the campus, but there are no classes that are taught live. So it's just like, you, know, you can live in the dorms and socialize a tiny bit, but all the courses are still on Zoom. And uh, yeah. it's weird. Yeah, I work on campus as well. So it gives me a reason to get out and about on campus. So it's kind of nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we made it all semester on campus without having to close. So we're all hopeful that we'll do the same this semester. Right. Well, what's the COVID situation in Wisconsin? Is it? Um, I'm not actually sure what it's like right now. I know it was not great in the fall semester. I don't really know if it's improved. Um, Are people wearing masks? For the most part. I know when I went home over winter break, it was... It's better here than it is there. Um, I know Fond du Lac County, which is like half, Ripon is partially in Fond du Lac County and they were hit really bad in the fall. Mm -hmm. For the most part, campus has been okay. Um, we're, they started doing more widespread testing on campus in the fall. Originally, it was just only if you had symptoms or were exposed that you got tested but we've been doing more full campus and random assignment tests. Huh. So. But the, the, my friend's daughter who went, who's on campus this semester, he said they test everyone twice a week. Nothing to do with symptoms. It's just, that's their rule. Twice a week, everyone gets tested. Yeah, I know. I have a friend at the University of Arizona who's talked about that. I think if, if they live on campus, it's twice a week, but even if they don't live on campus and just come for classes. It's once a week. And I mean, I've been, we've been back for a little under three weeks now. I've been tested twice because they did two full campus tests. But other than that, they only, they random select people once a week. Right. Um, but Have your parents been vaccinated? Um, my parents have not yet. I know I just heard one of my grandparents was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're over 65 or 75, you can get tested. We can get vaccinated if it's, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. If you're lucky. Yeah. That's the way it is here, you know, yeah. it's like now it's 65 and over, but it's not mm -hmm. automatic. It's like, you know, you, they put your name on a list and yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I will say that um, once COVID is gone, New York is one of the coolest places in the world to be. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm not from New York. My wife's not from New York, but we love it around here. We don't even live in New York. We live in the country, actually. But yeah. you know, you can um, you can be 20 miles from Manhattan and sort of be in the country. So uh, mm -hmm. that's where we are. And um, we opened the door this morning. There was fresh snow, and for some reason, the deer tracks actually had come up the steps of our house, and they were like. That's all, like I'm looking out of the window now where I, in my study and I have like a big backyard and all you see is like snow with the deer tracks. There's like deer everywhere. So, um, but for us, you know, we get on a commuter train and you can, we're, I can be at the graduate center in 40 minutes. So, um, cause it's just, cause the grad center is just a 10 minute walk from the Penn Station railroad station. But, um, but my kids live in Brooklyn, and uh, which is nowadays, if you're cool, that's where you have to be. It's like Brooklyn is like the place. It used to be Manhattan, but no more. So, um, uh, and there's just a lot of stuff going on. But you know, you have to like it. I mean, some people don't. Like, yeah. um, you know, I have friends who would like die before they move to New York. I mean, like that, or even close to New York, they would just wouldn't consider it. And other people love it. So it's sort of like where you fall in the spectrum, but yeah. you know, there's certainly a lot of stuff going on. And in mathematics, there's a huge amount because there are three major universities, CUNY, Columbia, and NYU. 
And uh, for example, in number theory, every Thursday there's a seminar, which is like the three places together. So like at five o'clock today, I'll log on and you know, to this CUNY Columbia Quran Institute of NYU uh, seminar. And people can go back and forth if they want to take classes at the other schools and whatever. It's just, you know, I mean, if you're interested in that, it's, it's like a good thing. Um, but some people love it, some people don't. Um, some people are afraid of it, some people thrive on it, I don't know. Yeah. It's certainly nothing I've experienced before, but I'm not opposed to the idea of it. Yeah, well, but the other thing is, of course, you watch TV and then you know everything there is to know about New York. I mean, um, there's like, there was a graduate student uh, who came um, a couple of years ago at the grad center. She came from China and her English was perfect. And I said, how did you learn English so well? And she said, well, the summer before she came, she just watched Seinfeld, every episode, I mean, over and over and over again. And you know, that's how she learned the language. So um, yeah. Well, anyway, you'll decide on, uh, you know, if you come, I know that um, people at the grad center will be happy, um, but you know, hopefully you have a couple of choices and you decide what is best for you and what most interesting. Yeah. Take care. Thank you, you too. Good luck.